sign up and be a hacker without doing anything. So you guys should do that. Um, I'm going to try and convince you that you should do that. And uh, if you don't agree with me, that's totally fine because you get to kick me out at the end of the day and do whatever you want. So um, I want to show you first a little bit about uh, the hackers I know and the kind of uh, folks I hang out with and um, and use that maybe as a model to think about what's possible in life hacking. Um, anybody got keys like this for your car? Like this. Yeah. Bloop. Yeah. yeah. Um, turns out you can just drive through a Walmart parking lot and click open, 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 bloop. And eventually some other car that looks kind of like yours will unlock, which is a fascinating thing. Because giant random numbers are free. We have a lot of them. But that hasn't occurred to the car manufacturers. For one of these companies, we figured out how to manipulate the key so that it'll open any car from that manufacturer. So you could just like drive by the dealership and bloop, pick a car. I think that's amazing. <laughs> I have all kinds of interesting things to tell you about that, but they're irrelevant for today's purposes. So we're moving on. <laughs> you guys have a. Uh, Lock like this on your front door? Yes. Yeah, statistically you have one. It's a Schlage lock. They're the cheapest lock at Home Depot, so they're on half of the doors in America. You guys ever try to pick locks? One guy, this guy. <laughs> All right, good. Excellent. So if you've got tools like this, it's a real pain in the ass. You stick them in there and finick with them, and if you have OCD and a lot of spare time, you'll figure it out. Um, for the ADD kids in the house, there's an easier way. I'm going to teach you. So this is a Schlage lock. This is a Schlage key, but it's not cut right, so it won't open the lock. But I modified the key so that I can just smack it. Oh. I'm not good at this in the morning. There we go. OK, I just picked this lock, which is really easy. This technique is called bump key. There's videos on YouTube of 11-year-old girls teaching you how to do it. Uh, that's how I learned. Um, I think that's an important life skill. So you know, you might, uh, there's a. I got a little carried away and bought a key machine and made this key ring, which has all the other kinds of keys in America uh, with bump keys. They're easy to make. You can make it with a file, so you can make one at home. Um, anyway, uh, moving on. Anybody use these uh, USB? Thumb drives, print my Word document for me. Well, mine is kind of like yours, except that while you're printing my Word document for me, it's just magically and invisibly making a handy little backup of your documents folder, your browser history and cookies, and your password database and the registry. That all goes in a little folder on here. In case you ever need it, I have a backup. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Anybody use uh, credit cards? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. We know they're wildly secure. We have one honest person <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> this is really testing you. Um, interesting thing is a few years back, we got these new credit cards in the mail that came with a letter explaining how it was a new secure credit card, which I got really excited about because I don't usually get secure stuff in the mail. Um, but since I know a little bit about this stuff, I started looking into it. And the reason it's supposed to be secure is it has this RFID chip in it. So, um, whoops, I'm going to try and show you how this works. So, since I know a little bit about RFIDs, I bought a bunch of RFID gear on the internet. One of the things I got was this reader from eBay for $8. It's just like the one at Starbucks. Um, and this thing, I had to make this complicated cable, which is there. OK, I turned it on. So these new credit cards, you don't even have to take them out of your wallet. You just wave it over the reader. So we thought, well, there's probably some encryption in there. And if we could crack the crypto, then maybe we could go steal some credit card numbers for fun on weekends. Um, so you guys use Python for your presentations? Or you know, it's like the new PowerPoint. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Can you see this? Okay. So I'm 
Uh, then we wrote this code, which is embarrassingly simple code. Anybody have one of these new credit cards? No? Come on up. <laughs> yeah, you're too secure for the new credit card. <laughs> this will be fun. So, um, so once you've got your reader and your complicated series of cables. Okay, here, now put it in your pocket. Now come on up here. Beep. Did you hear the beep? That's how you know a hacker is stealing your credit card number. <laughs> Excellent, okay, <laughs> thanks. So now you guys can all write that number down, <laughs> take it to <laughs> victoriasecret.com and order some stuff. Now the trick is have it delivered to your neighbor and then while they're at work, check their mail. Okay, so um, I thought this was an amazing thing. It turns out there's no crypto involved. We didn't have to crack anything. We just stand in the line at Starbucks and beat people's asses and get credit card numbers. <laughs> I don't uh, anyway, I was going to make some important point about security, but since uh, we have other important stuff to talk about, I'm going to skip that. Um, how do I play? Play. Okay. Um, oh, well, this is my subliminal marketing campaign here. That was supposed to go by much faster. Um, yeah. All right. So. This is an old buddy of ours named Sammy, um, a notorious computer hacker who was trying to meet chicks on MySpace. Anybody here ever use MySpace? Yeah, okay, it's kind of like Facebook, mostly for, for your grandparents or something. Um, and what Sammy figured out is that, you know, if you don't have any friends, then people can tell and you don't seem very cool. And since he didn't have any friends, uh, he didn't seem very cool and it wasn't working out. So what he did is he wrote a little bit of code to put on his page so that whenever you look at his page, it would just automatically add you as his friend and skip the whole, is Sammy really your friend protocol? And then it would say, it would change your page to say that Sammy is my hero. So um, it, he did one other thing, which is that he made the code copy itself to your page so that whenever anybody looked at your page, it would add them as Sammy's friend too. So in under 24 hours, Sammy had over a million friends. <laughs> um, and, you know, they had to shut down MySpace, and then, you know, Sammy had to serve three years of probation and not use a computer and uh, <laughs> had to meet chicks the old-fashioned way. So these days, <laughs> these days Sammy, uh, <laughs> Sammy's allowed to use a computer again. So you guys use these uh, map programs, right? So Sammy figured out how to hack his phone to lie to Google Maps so that wherever he's driving, Google Maps shows there's a bunch of traffic. <laughs> so people get off his roads. <laughs> so another buddy of ours, Abad, also trying to meet girls on the internet, figured out that he could take a spam filter uh, and Normally you train these things. You feed them legitimate email, you feed them some spam, and they use artificial intelligence to try and figure out the difference on incoming email. Well, Abad just trained it with profiles of girls he dated and liked as uh, legitimate email, profiles of girls he dated and did not like as spam, and then just runs it against every profile on the internet and outspits girls he might like to date. Um, which I think is genius. There should be like three spam dating startups here. Um, the point is, actually I did have a point I was going to make. The point is, these guys don't think like most people, right? These are, hackers have different brains. And these are really important brains because they're good at figuring out what's possible, right? So an example of this is if you get a new gadget and show it to uh, your mom or your grandma or um, someone on the street, they might ask you, well, what does this do? And you can explain. It's a phone, mom. iPhone. And they might understand from that. But if you give a new gadget to Abad or to Sammy, what do you think they're going to do? The question is different. The question is, what can I make this do? And they're going to flip it over, take all the screws out, break it into a lot of little pieces, but then figure out what 
can be built from the rubble. And that fundamental process of discovery, of figuring out what's possible, is why we talk about technology, right? Because that's where every new technology comes from. Somebody has to figure out what's possible. And so you're not going to figure that out by reading the directions, right? To figure out something new, you have to try everything that hasn't been done. That's a big deal. And when you're trying everything that hasn't been done, you're going to be wrong almost all the time. This is a protocol diagram for SSL. That's the encryption system in your browser that encrypts your credit cards when you send them to Victoria's Secret and Amazon. What hackers do is we attack every point in a protocol. What happens if I send a date from the future? Or what happens if I send a zero instead of a one? What happens if I send two responses instead of one? All the things that the people designing the protocol didn't think of. They were just trying to build something that works, something where you follow the directions and it does the right thing. Who has time to think about all the things that might go wrong? Well, hackers do. And we try every possibility. And almost all of them don't do anything useful, right? But I might be able to get it to break in some way. And if it'll break in one way, maybe I can get it to break in another way like a way that gives me your credit card number or whatever. This is what SSL actually looks like to hackers. If you get really bored and want a new life skill, learn to read hexadecimal. I did. Um, so this is Anopheles Defensi. So she's a female mosquito carrying malaria and she kills about a million people a year, mostly in Africa. Um, this is what she actually looks like flying. Uh, fascinating thing, humans don't know all about malaria and mosquitoes. We don't even understand how they can fly. That's not Bernoulli effect, their wings are too small. It's like swimming in air or something. It's kind of weird. This is a protocol diagram for malaria. It spends some of its life cycle in a human, some of its life cycle inside of a mosquito. It's pretty complicated. We don't understand everything about it, but to interrupt the life of malaria, and to combat malaria, we need to figure out how to attack every point in this protocol. There is no directions. No tablets came down from the mountain saying, here's how you save those lives, right? We have to figure it out. And that's what scientists are trying to do. That's what inventors and hackers are all trying to do, figure out what's possible. So in my lab, I hire hackers to attack every point in this protocol and figure out what can we do to save those lives. This is the old fashioned way of going after malaria. We spray chemicals that kill everything. This is a real ad from like the 30s or 40s. DDT, it's not really good for you. <laughs> um, so we came up with some other ideas. One of them is let's shoot them down with laser beams, which seemed exciting to us um, and also a little crazy. But uh, after hiring a hacker and buying some junk on eBay, we built a machine that finds mosquitoes and shoots them down with laser beams. This is kind of what that looks like. We were tracking some mosquitoes live here, and we, and we sample their wing, beat fre their wing beat frequency. And from that, we can tell this is a bug, it's a mosquito, it's an Ophelis defensi, and it's female. And then we shoot it down with a lethal laser. Right? This is kind of what that looks like. So, yeah, she's not coming back. <laughs> it's okay, you can laugh. Not even PETA will come stop us from killing mosquitoes. <laughs> we vaporized her wing, and you can kill as many mosquitoes as you want. It's really okay. Uh, yeah. And so the idea here, what's fascinating about this, is unlike spraying chemicals, which kill everything, we're using computers to compute the value of the life of every individual bug before we shoot it down. We can let bees and butterflies continue to do their thing and just kill the mosquitoes. Um, you might put, you know, our idea is that you'd put this on a fence post every 100 meters or so around a building or a village or a clinic and shoot mosquitoes as they fly towards humans, usually at dusk, to get a blood diet. Um, it's made of consumer electronics. That's beside the point. Moving on. So all this happens at um, the Intellectual Ventures Lab. So we just bought one of every tool in the world, hired one of every kind of scientist. This is our machine shop. 
Um, and what we try to do is go invent for the biggest problems that we can find in the world, right? This is our warehouse. We have another 8,000 tools that don't fit in the lab. There's everything here from scanning electron microscopes to ICBMs, but it's a way of being faster at testing our ideas. Uh, one of the things we do is computational modeling. So we have a 5,000 core computer we use to run uh, simulations on the transmission of disease in Africa. This is an important point because now, for the first time in human history, we have a surplus of computational ability. We don't even know what to do with it. We have fast computers and a shortage of ideas. So here, we model climate, rainfall, the travel of humans, everything that can affect the transmission of malaria in Africa, and then we can test our interventions thousands of times in software before we ever try it in the real world, right? So you can see, this is just Madagascar, but you can see if you're going to Madagascar, go to the middle. <laughs> There's no malaria there. But in the, you, know, you can see in the dry season, it almost goes away completely. So what if I sprinkle some DDT there? What happens if I spray some, or you know, deploy some bed nets over here? What happens if I deploy lasers over there? I can see what happens over the course of years and plot an eradication campaign, right? One of the points I want to make for you guys is that in this kind of work, what we do inventing, we're wrong almost all the time. We're wrong about 999 times out of 1,000. Our batting average is one. We suck. We fail all the time. And this model is an example of something where we fail. We try and try and try and try. We're wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong. And eventually we get one that looks pretty good. So failure is not the same thing as risking everything, right? There's very little risk in this. You know, all we're doing is running computers. Worst case scenario is we go home and watch Game of Thrones, <laughs> right? It's not so bad. So you can find ways to introduce more and more failure as a way of getting more and more success into your life. And I don't mean that you have to risk your entire life. It doesn't have to be so bad, but you have to get comfortable with being wrong, right? We invented a new type of nuclear reactor that's powered by nuclear waste. You recognize these guys? The 99% whose lives kind of suck in America? See if you can find yourself on this chart. <laughs> uh, it doesn't really matter where you are to me on that chart. The 99% in America, whoops, I don't know what happened with my graphic got screwed up. That's supposed to look cooler than that. Anyway, the point is, 99% in America is top 14% globally. You guys are like evolutionary lottery winners. You got to be human. That's about as good as it gets for a mammal. And then you're like socioeconomic lottery winners because you got to be American. That's pretty good. Like we already won the lottery twice and now we're nitpicking over how to win a third time. Being in the top 14% is not so bad. You could, no matter how bad you got it, it's not that bad. And what I think about that is it means that you know, you, you know, when we're looking at life hacking, we're looking at how to change our lives, we're looking at, well, how do we solve our problems? And a lot of times inventors, like me, are encouraged to find an itch and scratch it, find a problem to solve that you have. I don't have any problems. I don't have any real problems. I got, like, fake problems and stuff. My problems aren't that big of a deal. They're practice problems. Those are things for me to work on as practice so that I can get good at solving problems. And then, if I want to do something important, I'll try to find some other problem in the world. Problem somebody else has. Somebody who's not in the top 14%, who doesn't have time or resources to deploy in solving their own problem, who can't be fixated on life hacking. And I'll try and figure out how to use the practiced skills I have to solve some real problems. You got one of these in your pocket? This is an iPhone. Its cost is equivalent to the global median income, not for a human, but for a family. Right? If you have an iPhone in your pocket, you have more money in your pocket than a family in the world on average makes in a year. 
This woman's packing vaccines to transport into the bush in Africa to inject kids. A quarter million of them are going to die every year because those vaccines didn't stay cold. So we tried to invent a solution to that. I'm not going to talk about this because we're out of time. So we'll keep going. I'm going to skip all that too. Actually, I'm going to skip all this. Forget that thing. Here's the one thing I want to say. <laughs> so we're out of time, right? OK. Um, what I think about it is that I got lucky in a way because I got to learn very early to be comfortable with failure. And if you don't try something, you will not succeed, right? What a lot of people believe is that the fear of failure is paralyzing a lot of folks and keeping them from trying things. A lot of times the fear of failure, and, in the, and especially with high-tech industry and startups where we're constantly trying to start companies and most of them are failing, we worry about the fear of failure a little bit. The fear of failure for most people in high-tech comes from a fear of being seen as stupid by your peers, right? I don't care so much. I mean, I'm here to tell you, I have never worked for a company that still exists. Every company I ever worked on is gone, more or less. The one I'm still at is still exists right now. <laughs> but it'll, it'll eventually be gone. And if you just look on a longer time horizon, they're really all going to be gone, OK? In a lot of places, that would make me a failure, and nobody would give me a job. Since I live in this weird Silicon Valley bubble, it makes me pretty, uh, pretty good catch. Everybody wants me working for them because I know how to fail, right? Knowing how to fail is really important. And you can start by getting this into your daily life. And so going with the theme that we've talked about here of trying to find concrete things we can do, I think everybody here should try to find something you can do every day to embarrass yourself in front of your peers. Pick something. This is really important. Sing karaoke. If you've ever seen, you know, remember Mormons knocking on your door? Why do you think they're coming to your door? Because they think they're going to convert you? Maybe, I don't know. The real reason is it desensitizes them to the rejection, right? And if you practice that when you're 18 years old for a year, nobody's going to talk you out of being Mormon for the rest of your life because people have already tried and you've learned to put up with it, right, while you're young. Find something like that that you can do. I don't care what it is. Wear a crazy hat in public. Go, I do salsa dancing. Salsa dancing is like a lot of constant rejection. It's like, <laughs> oh, she doesn't like dancing with me and I'm stuck here for another three minutes. And they never tell you why. You never, that's part of the game. You don't, you get to guess and you're probably going to be wrong. And sometimes it goes great and you still don't know why. So you could find something like that and practice getting it. And I'm, I'm going to stick around for a little bit. I'm happy to talk to you guys about that, but I'm going to hand over the mic to whoever's next. Um, but I think it's the most important thing of anything you'll hear about life hacking and making yourself capable of change. So thanks. <laughs>